Uh, so, I've got some purchases to show that uh, from one day, one day's finds, just prior to, uh, we just had a record swap here in Santa Cruz, California. It was set up by one of the employees at the local uh, record stores, Metal, Metal Vinyl. It happens once a year. It's the only record swap we have right now. And it's also um, sponsored by uh, Verve Coffee, apparently. So it's a Metal Vinyl Verve Coffee um, event. And so it was really cool. Uh, I spent a lot of time there. I got there really early and I got some really cool stuff. Had to uh, really kind of make sure I didn't just blow all the money that I had and had to be pretty careful about what I got, making sure that, you know, I couldn't have everything that I wanted. Unfortunately, I'm going to actually go down and ask the record store owner today if he's got some of his stuff left that I was still interested in. So anyway, we'll start off with that, uh, what I got just prior to that. But I did want to do a quick thing on uh, comparing represses to, um, you know, uh, original issues or, you know, things that were, you know, one of the, not necessarily a first pressing, but something that was done in the original release of the album, one of the first, say, you know, more, one of the more original pressings, like the first, I mean, I'm not, I don't have any kind of parameters, but just say something that was from the 70s or from relatively recent, that isn't even classified as a reissue from back in the 70s. You'll notice that sometimes in Discogs, things will be a reissue by 1978, say, that was, you know, uh, actually issued in 1971. And so at some point it becomes a reissue. I don't know. I guess maybe when another record company picks it up or I'm not sure how that works. But anyway, these are comparing something that is definitely a reissue from recent years, like 2015 or so, 2009, whatever, compared to something that was, you know, printed back uh, when the album was closer to when the album was originally made. So first we have, I have um, The Seeds. So this is The Seeds, The Seeds. Here's the reissue. Now the reissue is a gatefold. Two records. The original that I have is one record. It has the same amount of music on both. The reissue, however, of course, of course uh, it has a gatefold. And then it's got a bunch of info on the band inside. That type of stuff. Let's see. And then I'm just show you both. Yeah. You know, just sort of explaining things about the band now. And then here's the um, the more original pressing that I have. Now, the first thing that you notice is that just the colors are different. I think, if you look, okay, now the reissue is going to be on your um, left. It's not as bright a green, kind of a darker green. It looks like it's uh things in this reissue here are kind of like well obviously a little clearer but the photograph is more contrasty and it actually doesn't have as many gray tones as the original it has sort of more even gray tones and then sort of the same thing is the case on the photo in the back here's the reissue okay and the original is uh once again well i don't know it in this case actually the original is kind of a little bit more contrasty but in both cases the reissue obviously looks like it's something that is sort of you know done a second time uh it just doesn't look quite as coherent it does look like something that was sort of reissued or you know redone that that's my feeling about it and so of course michael framer from analog plant always says that the artwork was never really important to the record companies to the people that were responsible for the artwork back then at record companies because you know rock and roll is considered ephemera or just sort of you know fly by night or whatever and so they didn't take it too seriously so uh i don't Maybe they had to just f actually photograph the actual old records to make these reissues. As in, the original artwork wasn't available, period. So, 
But I don't know, but in general I would just say that the reissues kind of seem like slightly more, not quite as authentic, obviously, uh, authentic uh, uh, products. And then so, and then I have also another one to sort of show you is, I'm just going to show you, show this real quick. It's a David Bowie's Aladdin scene. Now here, here's the reissue here. And clearly the colors are way different. He's a lot more gray here. Here, there's all you know, more pink, kind of more pink, just sort of, yeah. I don't know. With this one, they obviously somebody just changed stuff to their taste, is what I think. This was probably deemed too gaudy or glammy or something, because this is gray. Then it retains the pink in his face, but there's no flesh tones here in his in his torso or whatever so yeah it's just and this is a this is actually a gatefold this one isn't so this was one of these this was a later pressing but you know it's from the 70s what year is this even from i want to say 75 or 76 or something like that or 74 or 73 perhaps i, I forget i should have looked it up huh anyway so Okay, so those are the obvious differences in the color reproduction. But the big thing is is that the originals just sound better. They just do sound better. I'm not going to say they sound warmer. <laughs> they sound fuller. They sound you can the snare attack is more, you know, is more pronounced, is kind of brighter. It's more there. The first thing that I noticed when I was listening to the Seeds album in comparison was I heard the bass right off the bat. I listened to the same songs. And on the, the original issue of the Seeds record, I noticed the bass right away, whereas on the reissue, I did not. The reissues sound pretty good, but it sounds more, the sound is a little more even. Um, it's not as, it doesn't sound as real. The original issues, you feel like you could be sitting in a control booth listening to the band playing as you hear, you know, the articulation of each instrument more fully, I think, is what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to cut, we're going to, boom, go off of that and get into, right before the record swap, I picked up a few things in the store. I got Clash, London Calling, Japanese Pressing, uh, in very, very good condition with, uh, yeah, it was pretty, it was a little pricey. And now he said near mint, and I can see some ring wear on the very back and some other kind of staining near mint. Mm, it was pricey too. But anyway, I had another I had another copy of this and it isn't in the greatest condition. It's in decent shape and the records are in fine shape. But yeah, this is a this is a Japanese pressing without the OB strip. What I thought was cool was it has the insert record sleeves and uh they, uh, now where did I see this? Oh, yeah. So, in the record sleeve, or what, this is just some kind of a, so it's not the sleeves. This would have been record sleeves in the original, you know, in the, you know, in the way it usually is, record sleeves with the, um, lyrics. But I guess all the lyrics are in Japanese, in this Japanese pressing, so that's cool. It's kind of a, another way of like really proving that it is Japanese pressing, even though all the information is on the um, the sleeve. Oh, it has info on their other records, maybe something about the Clash, and then it's got the lyrics for some of the records, for just some of the songs. That's odd. Or maybe there's another one. Let's see. Uh, yes, there. No. I don't see another insert. You can see how... Oh, yes, there is. There's another insert. So, there's all the lyrics. And then there's other info on the bands. On the, you know, on the band. So, yeah, that's cool. London Calling, happy to have it in a Japanese pressing in really nice shape for a really lot of money. <laughs> uh, 
I think people would be surprised when a record collector will pay for certain records. <laughs> All right, so we're going to dive in. I also, something else that I got just prior to the swap was a bootleg live album, double album of Pink Floyd. Apparently one of the sides of this is Joni Mitchell live, just randomly. But these are bootleg, it's a bootleg Pink Floyd gatefold double album. Uh, there's another one. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure where it is, but it's it's another uh, Pink Floyd bootleg. Uh, it's it's listed under all their you know, their records, so it's it's definitely out there. Something else I got, I haven't really ever been a big Tool fan, but I'm willing to check them out. However, I did get this sealed in, it looks like, this is a Tool salable, salable, two records, I guess it's colored vinyl, but as you can see, it's sealed, hermetically sealed, uh, in this sort of like, I guess like if you had a meal ready to eat or something from the military, it would be sealed in something like this. So, now of course the price of this, I don't know if you can see the price, I'm not going to really mention the price, it's kind of crass I think, but the price of it sort of prohibits the opening of this because it'll obviously go down in value. I don't know what to do, how am I going to listen to the thing? This is just purely a collector's item apparently. So moving on from Tool, I'm going to get into what I got at the swap. So first is, off was David Bowie, Diamond Dogs. Cool record. I love the song Diamond Dogs. It's really always been one of my favorites. And then it was interesting to learn that, you know, David Bowie played all the guitars on this record. And, you know, if you think about it, like especially Diamond Dogs, it has the sound of you know, not really virtuoso guitar playing, but sounds really cool. I just love that guitar riff in Diamond Dogs. It it reminds me of, it's kind of like a Lou Reed kind of riff, that just sort of... I know. Something about it. Sounds really cool. So, Diamond Dogs. Well, it's not, a, I think Diamond Dogs is gatefold. This one isn't? I don't know. I also got Kraftwerk, half Florian. I was looking at the, but you know, I was actually at Dylan, you know, my buddy that I buy records from, not so Fredo. Uh, it was at his stall. He was there. He works at the store. He was there. He had a booth. He had a table. I was looking at the um, Kraftwerk because I'd already, you know, purchased Autobahn, and I was looking at some other ones and. Uh, this other, this other guy said, hey, do you have Half Florian? Because it's like one of the best ones, apparently. It's a really good one. So on the front, you can see there, I guess that's them. And then on the back, you can kind of see them with their setup. Kind of cool. There they are with their... They've got some acoustic instruments. They've got a bunch of synthesizers. And then, of course, their PA system looks pretty cool. Half Florian, and then they have a sign that says Half Florian. Looks like he's got some wind instruments there as well. A couple flutes. Yes, indeed, Half Florian. It, it's really cool record too. Like early electronica. You know, they say that you know, of course, Autobahn sort of like started the whole techno thing. Sort of it was like a precursor to it. I don't know. Oh, I forgot to throw in this. I got this. Before, I didn't get this at the swap, I got it at the store. This is um, Henri Poussur, and it's Early Experimental Electronic Music, 1954 to 1972. So this is Experimental Electronic. It's cool. And when I bought it, there's a guy in there that said, oh, that's cool, that's cool, you know, because sometimes these things are just way too ambient and sort of like, like elevator music, almost. But this one was pretty... This is interesting. This one is interesting because, it, you know, it, it gets into some, you know, sort of song structure. You know, now it's certainly very abstract, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's nice to have, to be somewhat grounded, I think. <laughs> as grounded as you can be. I also, something I actually ordered this one. Got it in the mail. This was pricey. Hard to find. It's Live Jam. Double album of, uh, it's a Live Jam album. Uh, it's a Polydor, so I guess it was uh, Made in England. So this is a 
lot of the jam stuff that you're going to see will have been pressed in England. I, I, don't, I, I guess maybe they pressed more in England than they did in the United States, which would certainly make sense. The jam were not a band that seemed to really take off very big here in the United States, which I don't know why. A lot of their, well, it, you know, a lot of their music, or, okay, their lyric, the songs, the songs deal with very English things. And some of them deal with situations that if you weren't English, like e the Eaton Rifles, for example, um, I had no idea what that song was really, I mean, I sort of had an idea. Obviously, he's talking about Eaton, the very famous English private, what they call them public schools there. You know, that's where the kids that go to Eton end up at, you know, Oxford and Cambridge, the Harvard and Yale of England. And so, anyway, it's obvious what the song is, obviously, but it has to do with sort of class uh, differences or whatever. But a lot of their, you know, I think a lot of the jam songs, they're, it's, it's, they're real, they're very English. They come across as very English. You know, he, he doesn't, He's not trying to, it, he, it almost sounds as if, I won't say it's not as if he's not trying to communicate with people from other cultures or other countries, but he's definitely singing to the English, to the British, to the UK, in a very big way, I think. Um, because, he, well, he's dealing with what's like right at hand, you know, and at the, at the time that he's making the records, it was a pretty controversial place. A lot, there were no jobs, everybody was on the dole. It was like kind of an abysmal place in some ways for young people, people that were just getting started out, you know. Imagine you're supposed to be getting started out in life and all there is to do is to go down to the unemployment office because this society that was going to give you a job as a, you know, that groomed you to be a metal worker anyway and now there's not even any work. I mean, that's, that's pretty grim. <laughs> anyway, I also, now this was prior to the swap, I got uh, Soft Machine Third. Soft Machine, very cool band, very cool third. So this is their third album. The first album is um, Soft Machine. The second one, I think, is. But anyway, it goes th like second, third, four, fifth, six, seven, <laughs> and um, they. So they, you know, they named. Uh, a bunch of the albums after numbers but then there are others that aren't so there's a lot of personnel changes in this band um, anyway they, they started in 1968 their first record is very difficult to find and it's pretty rare and then also if you can find it on discogs it's pretty pricey for a decent copy you can get a really beat up copy for like 25 bucks like really beat up and then also the thing about the first the first one which is like a legendary album in prog slash experimental rock going into fusion jazz fusion free jazz is um it was a cover that eventually it got censored in some pressings because it has this like wheel that turns against another background and there's a woman in a bikini or a naked woman and it's so it's like controversial and got censored and so there's censored copies and uncensored copies i actually just ordered a uncensored copy of their first record which is called Soft Machine and they had a lot of personnel changes over the years um, but they're really cool I have this one is good this is very good it's there's four sides and each side comprises a uh, a suite or one entire sort of uh, w you know work of music I guess so each side is more or less one song and so uh, very cool it does, of course, it, it is, you know, it's kind of, it's proggy, but even abstract, sort of, you know, getting into free jazz, certainly. I have Fifth as well, uh, which is an all-black cover with a five on it. Actually, I think it's just right, tell me, it's right here. Yep, there it is. Soft Machine, that's Fifth. You can't really see the sort of like embossed five there, but Fifth, very cool, very cool record is now back there and then also picked up at the store oh no this I actually ordered so this is Archie Shep on this night I've had other Archie Shep before bop uh, jazz player free jazz and this is again really cool live performance uh, Archie Shep on impulse 
great record label, great to have more um, Archie Shep on Impulse. Look at him, he's all sweaty. Just, he's going for it right there. Okay, so then at the swap, I also got Public Image Limited album. I'm not sure what this is because I know, I thought that they only really had the two releases officially albums. The Flowers of Romance being the second one. And the first one, I think, was just called. Uh, I want to say. Maybe this is it. I'm just going to check it out. I could have sworn I saw something with track listings. Uh, oh, yeah, on the record itself. Um. Oh no, this is a... Hmm. Hard to say what this is. Which one it is, or whatever. Well, it's album. But it looks really cool, doesn't it? I mean, Public Image Limited. Album. Awesome. On Electra. Also, New Order single, Blue Monday. I have another copy of this. Different sleeve. This is from 1988, New Order, um, Island Records, glad to find this, you know, it's cool, Blue Monday is a very cool song, um, I like the sleeve, you know, I'd like to have all, all their singles, all their records, certainly. Also, got from the Streetlight Record guys at The Swap, Bob Dylan, John Wesley Harding, a classic, certainly. This is an original issue, as it says, 2i. He explained to me, it has to do with the way it was pressed, and which what it was pressed from, and I'm gonna have to figure all that out. It has to do with the matrix numbers. I'm not an expert on that quite yet. Okay, also at the swap, Miles Davis and John Coltrane, live in Stockholm, 1960. Now, I was almost thought that this is what I've been looking for is how to put this that I had in the 90s live in Stockholm. And it is so that was one of my favorite John Coltrane CDs that I had back then. I've been trying to find it on vinyl and I haven't had much luck. And I've been asking around, seeing if anyone's seen it. I don't think I saw it on Coltrane's Discogs entry. I'm going to have to look again, but, oh, that's Live in Stockholm. Because I think the Live in Stockholm with John Coltrane on his own was from the more of the mid-60s. I want to say 1964. It could be wrong. But it's got this amazing rendition of my favorite things. And, you know, he did my favorite things, so many, you know, different versions of it. And what's was so cool about it is that, you know, he, he plays the song, My Favorite Things. It's recognizable as My Favorite Things. He always does it a little different, it seems like. But once he gets into the solo part of it, you know, he then that's when he sort of takes off and goes into the, you know, into the ether, into the stratosphere, into the really abstract zone. And just when you think he's never going to come back, he returns to the, the, the chorus of my favorite things. And it's just like, it's so cool when that happens, you know, on the record. And especially in the live version, you know, because the solo is so much longer than, you know, even the records, but I, I really want, want to find that show. And the other songs in that Live at Stockholm with John Coltrane are really good, but I'm, you know, here I'm to, to, here to talk about this one. This is a good record as well, you know, this is a, a good one to have. Um, it's uh, from Sweden, jazz from Sweden, uh, Dragon Records, uh, apparently. But, uh, yeah, Live in Stockholm. Uh, also, at the swap, I got Roxy Music's Avalon. I think I have just about all of them now, but there's one, you know, I've got one's a reissue. Their first their first record I have is a reissue. And then I've got a couple first presses, I think. Yeah, I do. I've got their live album. I now have Avalon, apparently, which is sort of, you know, this is a record, I guess, that at some point in the late 70s, like, everybody had this. And I think he starts to, if I'm not mistaken, I think we're getting into kind of a disco sort of vibe a little bit at this point with um, Avalon. And I thought Virginia Plain was on this 
album. Maybe it's not on the American version. That might be true. I, don't know. I also got more of Eric Satie, who I've mentioned before. The orchestral music of Eric Satie. This one, in this case, it's the piano music of Eric Satie. Volume 1. Aldo Cicciolini is the player. So he's doing Eric Satie's composition on piano. And they are sort of nice, you know, piano compositions. Uh, you know, nice kind of modern classical music, more or less. Modern in the sense that he was composing at the turn of the century, but that is, you know, would be sort of the beginning of the modern period, really. Technically, if you're talking like university terms or whatever. I also got, at the swap, Buzzcocks. This is a really, this is a good record. Um, it certainly is. Um, the Buzzcocks, Another Music in a Different Kitchen is the name of the record. The back doesn't really have much to show. Uh, yes, so this is, you know, the power punk, sort of power pop punk pioneers. The people with their pop punk. Oh, I like pop punk. I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound like a curmudgeon, but some of many of them don't even know what they're talking about. And it's like, this was the beginning. Orgasm addict. Also, John Coltrane, Black Pearls. Yes, this is a good record. Um, huh. It looks, you know, I'm just thinking about it now. Oh, right. So this was sort of like remastered in 89. So this is a, a bit of a reissue on Prestige. Yeah, I... It's not from the 60s. I, I don't know why I thought it was. Eh, oh, well. And I also... Uh, Brian Eno, BBC Sessions. Now, this isn't really his, like, abstract ambient music. This is actually his sort of, like, band music that he did. Which is pretty good, actually. And apparently this record is rare. It's relatively rare and hard to find. Um, it's got a cool cover, you know. Brian Eno, BBC Sessions. And then the other one that I have, I kind of blew it because I missed his... Someone had his, so this is Brian Eno as well, ambient, ambient music. Of course, Eno is, you know, an ex, you know, an expert at that. Steal away, first light. The plat, the plateau of mirror. Uh, those are some of the song names. But, yeah, Brian Eno, as far as the abstract musical genre, I think that he's way up there. You know, he's been doing it, you know, for a while. And that, that's his whole thing, you know. Now he's real, like Michael Framer says, you know, more, like, very scholarly looking now. And, but anyway, yeah. Brian Eno. Ambient. I got this really cool... Unfortunately, the record's warped a little. It does have a warp in it. The replacements, let it be. And there they are. I'm from Minneapolis. You can see this is obviously one of those houses in Minneapolis. Some old house it's got you can see in the window there's like some trophies up there whoever lived there i don't know if the guys the band lived there or what but yeah let it be this is a classic it's on twin tone records which is a you know a small label in minneapolis that you know all the local bands once the good ones once they were ready to make a record you know and they'd be on twin tone yeah not much to see on the back there but there's a yeah, Bob Stinson, unfortunately, you know, passed away. But this is the classic cover of them where, you know, there's Tommy Stinson right now here who was, you know, in Guns N' Roses eventually and then another band called Bash and Pop. But yeah, Tommy Stinson, there he is, picking his nose. It's funny, I've heard interviews with him and he still, you can hear his Minnesota accent down in there. It's classic. Oh, these guys were just classic Minnesota Minneapolis, you know, they'd be giving interviews on MTV and you could just hear their, the way they talk, their accents. I thought it was so funny. I mean, a lot of people, I guess other people must have noticed it too. But that was, they were saying back then in the 90s, then like, 
you know, they made that film Fargo that made fun of the accent of the Midwest, which is sort of the, most of the Fargo is shot in Minneapolis, or a lot of it, and they sort of make fun of the accent by having the characters, to, you know, they really like accentuate their accent and make it real obvious. And I remember when I was taking film, you know, films, uh, film production classes at community college back then, the, the, the instructor of the class was like, well, you know, that, you know, when they're, they're making fun of us, so that, that, that sort of puts us on the map at the same time, you know, like in New York and places like that. I thought that was really funny. Put us on the map by making fun of us. And then I also got Louder Than Bombs, Smith's. This is a Rough Trade original type pressing. It's got a little hole right here, unfortunately, but, you know, these things are hard to find. Anything by the Smiths now that was on Rough Trade, valuable. This was a relatively expensive record in spite of this flaw here. Someone else had a pretty perfect, um, in pretty perfect condition uh, copy of this, and I was not ready to go there and pay that for it. I figured I'll just pay this. I've got, you know, The Queen is Dead. I have a really nice copy of that that I think it's on colored vinyl but it's the first pressing as well as being the colored vinyl the queen is dead yes very you know really cool record this is a good record as well you know obviously and then i also got a smith single um how how soon is now this single i got i don't know if you can see the price tag this is a single with uh i think there's a total of three songs pricey the guy that I got this from had, I, I got this other Smith's record from him as well. He had a bunch of Smith's records. And, uh, yeah. I've got um, The Queen is Dead. I have another one of him. But then I also have another copy of How Seen Is Now. A different version. A different cover and stuff. And then I have a first pressing of Mita's Murder. Somewhere. And then Kraftwerk Autobahn. As I sort of mentioned, that's the classic. And lastly, I have Black Flags, the first four years. And this is from like 1989 or 1986. So this is an SST record. You know, this is an original pressing, even though it is a compilation of previous uh, seven inches. And it has stuff from, I think it's 1983, 1983. So this record was done in 1983, and it covers stuff from, 1976 to 1983 and it looks like there's the nervous breakdown single is on here and then six pack most of this all this stuff came out on seven inch at one time i believe i think that's how that works and then they issued this and then black flag did things like jealous again and well i guess they show all the covers that these records are from so the eps and actually it looks like um there would have been some stuff from Damaged, even? Maybe. You know, I had that one. I had Jealous Again. I had Six Pack, Nervous Breakdown, Damaged, which isn't on here. I can't believe I had those things. And, you know, I don't have them anymore. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's going to be the end for that. Please like and subscribe and tune in. Appreciate it. Take care.